Good evening from the uh, Home Office of Apollo Cardiology. Tonight we'll do an AMA. I saw a lot of uh, good questions about lipoproteins. I saw a couple questions about um, different you know, treatments for atherosclerosis. So I'll hit those as we go. But if you have any other questions, happy to have you uh, pop them in here in the comments. And I see Dr. Max is joining. So uh, when I'm done with this, I'll uh, catch up uh, with him in about an hour or so and uh, be shooting a podcast with him a little bit later. It'll be all things cardiovascular health, but I'm sure we'll hit a lot. Of all right. So sorry if that was glitching. I think that I just had to switch off uh, the internet and uh, go to just uh, do it off of a cell network here. So starting answering a few of your questions here. <clears throat> so question, what is the lowest dose statin to use if diet doesn't correct a high lipo A in a 70 year old? Um, so lipoprotein A uh, is not going to really change much with diet. You know, if you do something that helps lower inflammation, that might help lower LPLA a little bit. But if you're talking more about apolipoprotein B, well, the lowest dose statin that I tend to use in my practice is resuvastatin, five milligrams twice a week. Get generally a decent amount of benefit, um, you know, doing it twice a week compared to doing it daily. And rarely do I, you know, push that uh, to you know, 40 milligrams. That's a rare occurrence. So use low and work your way up. And it's going to be based off of the um, cholesterol balance test mostly. Good question. Um, who's asking why are stands criticized so often? Um, I think it's just because, you know, there are side effects for any medication that you take. And I do believe that there's a role for stands for people, you know, especially secondary prevention. If you've already had your chest cracked open and got multivessel bypass, you have multiple stents, you've had a stroke, stands are going to try to reduce the risk that you have that happen again. Where the uh, controversy comes in more is kind of for primary prevention. You know, you're just doing it for prevention. There's a little bit more of a nuance in that situation. But the things are that can be controlled is, you know, look and see, do you have endothelial dysfunction? Do you have vascular inflammation? Do you have plaque in your arteries? If the answer is yes, then SANS might be a tool for you. Not, you know, guarantee, but you want, need to work with somebody who understands how to use these tools appropriately. You know, muscle symptoms are the main side effect for them. You know, muscle pain, weakness, and I've never seen a case of rhabdomyolysis from a statin. I've seen many cases of rhabdo in my life, but not from a statin. So that's why they tend to get criticized is the side effect profile sometimes. High LDL particle number, but fluffy. High oxidized LDL, but zero calcium and good blood pressure. Um, what are the specs for diet? So just because your LDL particles are, quote, fluffy, you know, it's much more about the total number of particles than it is the size. The size does matter in ways and that if you have small LDLs, you know, the pattern B, they are more likely due to insulin resistance, but there are genetic reasons why you might have low lipoproteins, but low or I should say small LDLs tend to oxidize more. So that if you have high oxidized LDL and you have quote fluffy LDL, there's something else going on. Are you insulin resistant? Are you eating, you know, a lot of, um, you know, trans fats? You know, is there something else that's causing some of the oxidation? Um, so Direx have to see more labs to know for sure, but you know, make sure you're not insulin resistant and you really kind of push the omega threes for the fats. So this is answered a little bit in the other question is, you know, what are my thoughts on statins? You know, this person's cardiologist wants them to take them. It always depends on what's going on with the arteries. So sometimes I've been using the uh, kind of the saying now that you know, I'm from Missouri, you're going to have to show me, show me what your arteries look like. You know, if you have plaque in your arteries, you may consider a statin, but I tend to use more advanced testing that looks at if you're a hyper producer of sterols or if you're a hyper absorber of sterols. And often we'll do a GB insight panel to look at your SNPs to figure out which medications would you tend to tolerate best with the least amount of side effects. So they're a tool not to be used in all, but you'd have to talk to your doctor why they're recommending a particular statin for you. Can the sheer stress of a weekly HIT training on cardiac arteries induce plaque formation? The answer is possibly. Um, you know, as you exercise, the blood's going to flow across the endothelial glycogalyx. It's going to transmit that shear stress to the underlying endothelium and then nitric oxide is going to get released. That is in a healthy artery. But, you know, if you're driving your heart rate to 180, 190, you may increase the shear stuff enough that you slough off some of the glyco 
like glycosaminoglycans in the endothelial glycocalyx. You know, it's more when you have you know unmitigated oxidative stress and inflammation that would be that the case, but it is possible. So, you know, exercise is a drug. You know, no exercise, bad, excessive. You know, exercise, particularly like marathon running, you know, ultra marathons, you know, triathlons, that puts a heavy, you know, metabolic toll on the body as well as stresses the cardiovascular system. You know, it's an impressive, you know like feet of uh, endurance, but it's not necessarily healthy for your arteries to do that. More the ultra endurance, not just hit in general. Question, what brands of photobiomodulation do I recommend? Um, I have a website, redlightdoc.com, and it has some of the recommendations of the ones that I tend to use. But in my office, I have a lot of the EMR tech panels. That's my uh, eight foot tall beast panel that I have in the office, which I use to uh, educate patients on how to use photobiomodulation to optimize their health and their mitochondria. Next question, for stroke patients, why do physicians focus so much on total cholesterol and statins? Um, it really depends on what caused the stroke. You know, you know, if it's embolic, you know, then that's a different situation. But, you know, the statins in that instance is mostly it's an anti-inflammatory. It's probably the reason they're considering it, you know, during a stroke. That's like a five alarm fire to your vascular system. Um, so total cholesterol, you know, it's something I would look at, but you know, unless it's north of 300 milligrams per deciliter and possible FH, um, familial hyperlipidemia, I don't focus on total cholesterol. You need to focus on the lipoproteins or look at ApoB. So somebody's asking, can I go deep on the science of hypersecretion and re Container of saturated fat blood test. So I think what this individual is asking is about the uh, cholesterol balance test and the fatty acid balance test on the Boston Heart Lab panel. So on the cholesterol balance test, there's two data points. It's if you're a hyper producer of sterols or if you're a hyper absorber of sterols. So it looks for the production. If you're high in um, desmosterol or lanthosterol, those are produced in the liver. They're the penultimate step prior to cholesterol being made. Um, and then the hyperabsorption is if you're high in um, beta cytosterol is the main one. Another one, top of my head, I just forgot it for one second, but I'll remember it in a minute. But if the panel is in the green zone, you're normal. If it's in the red zone, you're either a hyperproducer or hyperabsorber, depending on which panel it's abnormal in. Um, the hyperproducers tend to tolerate or respond better to, uh, you know, things that work on blocking HMG coreductase, so, you know, bergamot, red yeast rice, statins, or, you know, if they're intolerant statins, uh, bimbidoic acid works in a pathway two steps away. It's an ATPase, ATP citrate lyase inhibitor, um, and it lowers the production of sterols in the liver. If you're a hyperabsorber of sterols, which approximately 20% of the population is, then the medication azetamide, which is a cholesterol reabsorption inhibitor, closes that Neiman C1 like one receptor, and your lipids tend to improve. So I use it pretty much in all my patients who have lipid issues because it helps really you do precision medicine and figure out which therapies will work best for the patient. Question, can we do something naturally to reduce progress of hypokinesis in the heart? So hypokinesis means a weakening of an area of the myocardium or heart muscle. Uh, what can you do naturally? Um, you know, it would probably be something that would improve your redox potential. So using sunlight therapy, heliotherapy, or using photobiomodulation therapy to activate stem cells. Uh, grounding would be something natural. Everything else, you're going to be looking at uh, supplements and medications to potentially improve myocardial performance. Sauna therapy may help as well. Question, how can you remove plaque from the arteries without medical operation? So the medical operation for removing plaque really is only for carotid endarterectomies. Um, and that surgery still happens, but isn't as common as it once was. Um, if the plaques are in the other arteries, you do just medically manage them. 
Um, you know, I always kind of say that there's three things you need to focus on. One, you need to have a healthy, you know, nitric oxide level and healthy endothelial glycocalyx. There's lots of testing that I've talked about before that look at that. Second, got to have no significant oxidative stress or inflammation. You don't want the arteries to be on fire. And third, you need to have reasonable lipoproteins. Cholesterol is always going to be present in the plaques, but it's not the boogeyman. So I don't think people should hyper-focus on just lowering cholesterol. They need to fix the other things that are going on with the vascular system. So those are the main levers that need to people need to focus on. And there's a multitude of different uh, medications and supplements that potentially help with that. But you need blood work to kind of point you in the right direction for a lot of those. All right. So I think I got through the... Uh, Pre-populated questions. Thank you, guys. Those are some good ones tonight. Uh, question, does it help to eat in season where you live? Has that been studied or, or observed? Um, it's been both, you know, mainly observed. I mean, you know, people have always eaten seasonally up until they're able to ship foods around the world. So it's been observed, you know, for many, many years. Um, studied, yes, but that's not my area of focus. Um, but it just theologically makes sense. You know, you would have only eaten what the sun would have grown in your environment. So your mitochondria's job is to reverse photosynthesis, you know, or you eat the animal that ate the plant. So, you know, that's the best way to think about it is that your body is always trying to figure out, you know, what time of day it is and what season it is. So, you know, probably some of the people following this, uh, Live tonight, you know, follow, you know, Dr. Jack Cruz, who I've met many times. You know, he had a famous, you know, um, analogy when he was in a conference once. You know, if you eat a banana in January in Boston, you are not very wise because bananas do not grow in Boston in January. You know, they're full of deuterium. They're summer foods. You know, if your skin, eyes are sensing that it's winter, you would not be putting summer foods into your body. So, uh, so it just makes theological sense, um, but has been rigorously studied. Probably not, because every time they study things, they're putting people in metabolic wards and trying to monitor them under artificial light in you know situations where they're not normally going to be eating that way. So, um, so do I strictly follow a seasonal diet? No. Uh, you know, I'm just being flat out honest on that. But relatively, yes. And you know, I would say that it depends on you know, how sick you are or how poor your redox potential is. You know, the sicker you are, the more strict you have to be on that one. How often is it recommended to do a CT angiogram? Um, it would depend on, you know, why you had one originally. If it's just for screening purposes, um, potentially three years later, um, you know, if you're actually having symptoms, you know, they would do it sooner. So if you're having chest pain, choice of breath, you know, heart failure, you know, they may do it sooner to look to see if, you know, prior stents or bypass uh, has failed. But I'd need to know more info to know kind of the true uh, recommendations. But if you're asking for like a clearly CT angio, probably three years is most likely the time frame. But got to work with the person who recommended the first one for you. So somebody's asking about, you know, stands and blood brain barrier. Um, you know, they all can cross, you know, but tend to use more pravastan or resuvastan in those situations. You know, but if people really can't tolerate them, then bimpedoic acid, um, you know, has data from the uh, recent clear trials. You know, so if you can't tolerate stands or you're concerned about it because you're an ApoE4 carrier, consider you know bimpedoic acid or one of the PCSK9 inhibitor. All right, so somebody likes the blue blockers. Yeah, these are my old school 2017 vintage uh, True Darks. So. All right. I used to joke I had more blue blockers than I did shoes. Now I got a few more shoes than I do blue blockers, but I want to all just mix them up. All right. Well, I think I got through all the uh, questions tonight. Um, yeah, I said earlier, you know, Dr. Max and I are going to shoot a podcast in about an hour or so. And we're talking about a lot of these topics in more depth. I'm um, also talking about some of the quantum topics. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, I don't know, you know, how fast he's going to uh, turn it around. But, you know, once I have information about it, I'll start sharing that in my stories of when it'll be released. And you can hear the, the full podcast then. 
So next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, we'll do this again. Um, have a great week. And uh, if you guys aren't following me yet on YouTube, that's probably the best way to support me at this time because I'm going to try to grow that channel a little bit over the next few months. I'll put a little bit more long-form content there. Yeah, I'm starting to use the uh, some of the cool AI tools that I've learned about in the past couple of weeks to be able to do some uh, transcription of these IG lives and you can search for them a little bit easier. So, uh, so if you follow me on Instagram, it's the same handle, but just at YouTube. So hope you guys have a great week and we'll see it. See you next time.